Before leaving, I'll give you a small device and teach you how to attach it to yourself, so that if you have at any time to submit to a physical examination, you'll easily be mistaken for a man. As soon as he'd made a boy of me, we left for Bologna, and all occurred just as he'd planned. People laugh at premonitions. I don't believe in them myself, but I had a foreboding of evil which almost broke my heart as he gave me his farewell kiss. Alas, my fears proved only too prophetic. Salimberry died a year ago in the Tyrol, in the prime of life. His death compelled me to earn my living with the assistance of my musical talent, and my new mother advised me to continue to give myself out as a castrato. I agreed, for I didn't feel sufficient energy to decide upon any other plan. After Salimberry, you are the only man I've known, and, if you like, you can restore me to my original state and make me give up the name of Bellino. If you love me, my beloved angel, free me from this state of shame and degradation. Take me with you. I don't ask to become your wife. That would be too much. That would be too much happiness. I'll be your friend, your mistress. Don't abandon me. The love I have for you is sincere. It's only with you that I have felt myself truly a woman. Her emotion and the inexpressible charm which seemed to flow from her lips made me shed tears of love and sympathy. Deeply moved, I promised to make her the sharer of my fate. Abandon the engagement you have in Rimini, I said. Come with me to Venice, dressed as a woman and with another name, and I defy the manager here to find you out. And so I will, said Therese. You shall always be my law. I give myself to you without any reservations. My heart belongs to you, and I trust to keep yours. Man has something in him which always makes him overstep the mark he's on. I'd obtained everything. I wanted more. Show me, I said, how you are when people think you a man. She got out of bed, opened her trunk, and took out the dildo. Then she showed me how she fixed it to herself, using a special gum. I was compelled to admire the ingenuity of the contrivance. My curiosity satisfied, I passed a most delightful night in her arms. We left Remini the next day, bound for Bologna, where I intended to make her my wife. We stayed for breakfast at Pizarro. As we were getting into the carriage to leave that place, an officer, accompanied by two soldiers, presented himself, inquired for our names, and demanded our passports. Bellino had one and gave it, but I looked in vain for mine. I couldn't find it. The officer, a corporal, orders the postillion to wait, and goes to make his report. Half an hour afterwards he returns, gives Bellino his passport, saying that he can continue his journey, but tells me that his orders are to escort me to the commanding officer. I follow him. "'What have you done with your passport?' inquires the officer. "'I've lost it.' "'Then you can proceed no further.' "'I come from Rome,' I said. "'I'm going to Constantinople, bearing a letter from Cardinal Aquaviva. "'Here is the letter, stamped with his seal.' All I can do for you is to send you to a Monsieur de Gagis. I found the famous general standing surrounded by his staff. I told him all I'd already explained to the officer and begged him to let me continue my journey. The only favor I can grant you, said the general, a cross-grained Castilian, is to put you under arrest till you receive another passport from Rome. Deliver it under the same name as the one you've given here. With these words, he gave orders to take me to the guardhouse at St. Mary's Gate outside the city, as soon as I'd written to the cardinal for a new passport. His orders were executed. I was brought back to the inn where I wrote my letter, and I sent it by express to his eminence, entreating him to forward the document without loss of time direct to the war office. Then I embraced Therese, who was weeping, 
and told her to go to Rimini and to wait there for my return. She wouldn't have left me if I hadn't promised to join her within ten days, never to be parted again. Unfortunately, fate had decided otherwise. When we reached the gate, the officer confined me immediately in the guardhouse, where I passed a fearful night. The officer who relieved the Castilian on the following day seemed of a different nature altogether. He was a Frenchman, and he approached me very politely. To what chance, Ravenser, am I indebted for the honour of having you in my custody? Ah, here was a way of speaking which restored to my lungs all that elasticity. I gave him all the particulars of my misfortune, and he found the mishap very amusing. He at once gave me a soldier to serve me, and I very quickly had a bed, a table, and a few chairs. He invited me to share his dinner, and proposed a game of piquet afterwards. The following night he had company to supper, and we all played faro. After about nine or ten days, everyone in the army knew and liked me, and my passport could not be delayed much longer. I was almost free, and I'd often walk about even out of sight of the sentinel. They were quite right not to fear my running away. But then the strangest adventure of my life happened to me, and most unexpectedly. It was about six in the morning. I was taking a walk within one hundred yards of the sentinel, when an officer arrived and alighted from his horse, threw the bridle on the neck of his steed, and walked off. Admiring the docility of the horse, standing there like a faithful servant to whom his master has given orders to wait for him, I go up to him and, without any purpose, get hold of the bridle, put my foot in the stirrup, and find myself in the saddle. I was on horseback for the first time in my life. I don't know whether I touched the horse with my cane or with my heels, but suddenly the animal starts at full speed. My right foot, having slipped out of the stirrup, I pressed against the horse with my heels, and, feeling the pressure, it gallops faster and faster, for I didn't know how to check it. At the last advanced post the sentinels call out to me to stop, but I can't obey the order. And as the horse carries me away faster than ever, I hear the whizzing of a few musket balls. At last, when I reach the first advanced picket of the Austrians, the horse is stopped, and I get off his back, thanking God. An officer of hussars asks where I'm running so fast. My tongue, quicker than my thought, answers without any forethought on my part that I can render no account but to Prince Lobkowitz. Commander-in-Chief of the Army. Hearing my answer, the officer gave orders for two hussars to get on horseback. A fresh one is given to me, and I am taken at full gallop to Army Headquarters at Rimini, where the officer on guard has me escorted at once to the Prince. I find His Highness alone, and I tell him candidly what has just happened to me. My story makes him laugh, although he observes that it's hardly credible. I ought, he says, to put you under arrest, but I'm willing to save you that unpleasantness. With that he called one of his officers and ordered him to escort me through the Cesena gate. Then, he added, you can go wherever you please, but take care not to enter my army's lines again without a passport. You might fare worse than you did this time. So I found myself free, with gold and jewels, but without my trunk. Therese was in Rimini, and I couldn't enter that city. So I made up my mind to go to Bologna as quickly as possible in order to get a passport, and then return to Pizarro, where I should find my passport from Rome. It was raining. I had silk stockings on, and I longed for a carriage. I took shelter under the portal of a church, and turned my fine overcoat inside out so as not to look like an ave. At that moment, some forty mules, laden with provisions, came along the road towards Rimini. It was still raining fast, and the mules passed close by me. I placed my hand on the neck of one of them, and, following the slow pace of the animals, I re-entered Rimini, without the slightest notice being taken of me, even by the drivers of the mules. I gave some money to the first street urchin I met, and he took me to Therese's house. There I found all the family and Therese in a woman's dress. I gave a full account of my adventures, 
but Therese, frightened at the danger that threatened me, and in spite of her love, told me that it was absolutely necessary for me to go to Bologna. I allayed Therese's anxiety by telling her that I could easily contrive to leave the city without being observed. It was only eight o'clock in the morning. We had the whole day before us, and everyone promised to be discreet. Therese took me to her own room. There she told me that she'd met the manager of the theatre, and that she'd informed him that she was a woman, and that she'd made up her mind not to appear as a castrato any more. He'd expressed himself delighted at the news, because in Rimini women could appear on stage, unlike Ancona, which was under a different legate. She added that her engagement would be at an end by the first of May, and that she'd meet me wherever I chose. As soon as I can get a passport, I said, there's nothing to hinder me from remaining near you until the end of your engagement. That evening we all had a joyous supper together, and as we were getting ready to go to bed, Petronio came in to inform me that ten muleteers would start for Cesina two hours before daybreak, and that he was sure I could leave the city with them if I'd go and meet them a quarter of an hour before their departure and treat them to something to drink. I made up my mind to try. I asked Petronio to sit up and to wake me in good time. It proved an unnecessary precaution, for I was ready before the time, and left Therese satisfied with my love, without any doubt of my constancy, but rather anxious as to my success in attempting to leave Rimini. I went to the stable, and having treated one of the muleteers to some drink, I told him that I would willingly ride one of his mules as far as Sarinyang. "'You're welcome to the ride,' said the good fellow. "'But I advise you not to get on the mule till we're outside the city, "'and to pass through the gate on foot as if you were one of the drivers.' "'It was exactly what I wanted. "'Petronio accompanied me as far as the gate, "'where I gave him financial proof of my gratitude. "'I got out of the city without the slightest difficulty "'and left the muleteers at Sarignan. "'From there I left for Bologna.' Once there, I discovered that I couldn't obtain a passport, for the simple reason that the authorities of the city persisted that it wasn't necessary. I resolved to write to the French officer who treated me so well at the guardhouse. I begged him to inquire at the war office whether my passport had arrived from Rome, and, if so, to forward it to me. I made up my mind to wait for Therese in Bologna, and I informed her of my decision, entreating her to write very often. I'd been careful, on my arrival in Bologna, to take up my quarters at a small inn so as not to attract any notice. As soon as I'd dispatched my letters to Therese and the French officer, I thought of purchasing some linen, as it was at least doubtful whether I should ever get my trunk. I deemed it expedient to order some clothes likewise. I was thinking this when it suddenly struck me that I wasn't likely now to succeed in the church. Feeling great uncertainty as to the profession I ought to adopt, I took a fancy to transform myself into an officer. It was a very natural fancy at my age, for I'd just passed through two armies, in which I'd seen no respect paid to any manner of dress but to the military uniform. I didn't see why I should not cause myself to be respected likewise. I inquired for a good tailor and explained to him how I wanted my uniform made. I chose the cloth, he took my measure, and the next day I was transformed into a soldier. I procured a long sword, and with my fine cane in hand, with a well-brushed hat, I sallied forth. I like even now to recollect the pleasure I felt when I was able to admire myself full length in a large mirror. I was highly pleased with my own person. I thought myself made by nature to wear and to honour the military costume which I'd adopted. My uniform was white, the vest blue, a gold and silver shoulder knot, and a sword knot of the same material. Thinking that my new calling required a better and more showy lodging, I moved to the best inn. Very well pleased with my grand appearance, I went to the coffee-room and, taking some chocolate, began to read the newspapers, quite at my ease, and delighted to see that everybody was puzzled. When I'd sufficiently enjoyed public admiration in the coffee-room, I promenaded in the busiest thoroughfares of the city, and returned to the inn where I had dinner by myself. 
I'd just concluded my meal when my landlord presented himself with the traveller's book in which he wanted me to register my name. Casanova, I said. You profession, if you please, sir? Officer. Um, in which service? None. Your birthplace? Venice. And where have you arrived from? That is no business of yours. This answer, which I thought was in keeping with my external appearance, had the desired effect. The landlord bowed himself out, and I felt highly pleased with myself. On the fourth day of my stay in Bologna, I received by express a long letter from Therese. She informed me that on the day after my escape from Rimini, the Duke de Castropignano, having heard her sing, had offered her one thousand ounces a year and all travelling expenses paid if she accepted an engagement as prima donna at the San Carlo Theatre at Naples. She said that if I wished to accompany her to Naples, she'd meet me anywhere I might appoint, but that if I had any objection to return to that city, she would immediately refuse the brilliant offer for her only happiness was to please me in all things. For the first time in my life I found myself in need of thoughtful consideration before I could make up my mind. Two motives of equal weight kept the balance wavering, self-love and love for Therese. I felt that I ought not to require Therese to give up such prospects of fortune, but I could not take upon myself either to let her go to Naples without me or to accompany her there. On one side, I shuddered at the idea that my love might ruin Therese's prospects. On the other side, the idea of the blow inflicted on my self-love, on my pride, if I went to Naples with her, sickened me. How could I reappear in that city as a cowardly fellow living at the expense of his mistress or his wife? What would all the patricians who knew me say? In spite of my love for Therese, I should become very miserable if everyone despised me. The die was cast. My head had conquered my heart. I hit on an excellent expedient, which at all events gained me time. I wrote to Therese, advising her to accept the engagement for Naples, where she might expect me to join her in the month of July or after my return from Constantinople. Four days later I left for Venice. Before my departure I'd received an answer from the French officer advising me that my passport had reached Pissarro and that he was ready to forward it to me with my trunk, and I received my trunk and my passport a few hours before leaving Bologna. To go to Venice it was necessary to submit to a quarantine. I didn't wish to be quarantined and was determined to evade it. This was rather a delicate undertaking, for in Venice the sanitary laws are very strict. I knew that between the state of Mantua and that of Venice the passage was free, and I knew likewise that there were no restrictions in the communication between Mantua and Modena. If, therefore, I could penetrate into the state of Mantua by stating that I was coming from Modena, I could then cross the Po and go straight to Venice. This is precisely what I did and I reached Venice in the evening of that day. It was the 2nd of April, 1744, the anniversary of my birth. The very next morning I went to the exchange in order to procure a passage to Constantinople, but I could not find any passenger ship sailing before two or three months. So I engaged a berth in a Venetian ship called Our Lady of the Rosary, which was to sail for Corfu in the course of the month. Having thus prepared myself to obey my destiny, which, according to my superstitious feelings, called me imperiously to Constantinople, I went to St. Mark's Square in order to see and to be seen, enjoying by anticipation the surprise of my acquaintances at not finding me any longer an abbé. I thought that my first visit was, by right, due to the abbé Grimani. The moment he saw me, he raised a perfect shriek of astonishment for he thought I was still with Cardinal Aquaviva on the road to a political career, while before him he saw standing a son of Mars. I told the abbé that I was only passing through Venice, and that I'd felt it a duty and a pleasure to pay my respects to him. 
I next called upon Madame Manzoni, whom I was longing to see. She was very happy to see me, and I told her my history, which amused her much. But she said that if I went to Constantinople, I should most likely never see her again. Next, I went to the house of Madame Orio, where I found Nanette and Martin. They were all greatly surprised at seeing me, and the two lovely sisters looked more beautiful than ever. Seeing that the good old lady was carried away by her enthusiasm, I told her that I should be very happy to spend the four or five weeks of my stay in Venice under her roof, if she could give me a room and supper, but on condition that I shouldn't prove a burden to her or to her charming nieces. The room adjoining the chamber of the two sisters was put at my disposal. Nanette said immediately that she and her sister would sleep downstairs, but Madame Orio answered that it was unnecessary as they could lock themselves in their room. There would be no need for them to do that, madam, I said with a serious and modest air. Everything being satisfactorily arranged, I forced upon Madame Orio a payment of fifteen sequins in advance, assuring her that I was rich and that I was making a very good bargain, as I should spend a great deal more if I kept my room at the inn. I added that I'd send my luggage and take up my quarters in her house on the following day. During the whole of the conversation I could see the eyes of my two dear little wives sparkling with pleasure, and they reconquered all their influence over my heart in spite of my love for Therese, whose image was, all the same, brilliant in my soul. This was a passing infidelity, but not inconstancy. The following day I called at the war office. As soon as I explained that I wanted to go to Constantinople, and that, although in uniform I was free, I was advised to go with the Bailo, who intended to leave within two months, and to try to obtain service in the Venetian army. That day I dined with the officer commanding, Major Pelodoro, and several other officers, who agreed in advising me to enter the service of the Republic, and I resolved to do so. "'I am acquainted,' said the Major, "'with a young lieutenant whose health is not sufficiently strong to allow him to go to the East, and who would be glad to sell his commission. He wants one hundred sequins, but it would be necessary to obtain the consent of the Secretary of War.' "'Mention the matter to him,' I replied. "'The one hundred sequins are ready.' "'The Major undertook the commission. "'And that evening I went to Madame Orio, "'and I found myself very comfortably lodged. "'After supper the aunt told her nieces to show me to my room, "'and, as may well be supposed, "'we spent a most delightful night. After that they took the agreeable duty by turns, and in order to avoid any surprise in case the aunt should take it into her head to pay them a visit, we skilfully displaced a part of the partition which allowed them to come in and out of my room without opening the door. But the good lady believed us three living specimens of virtue, and never thought of putting us to the test. Towards the end of the month I entered the service of the Republic as an ensign in the Bala Regiment then stationed in Corfu. The young man who'd left the regiment with my one hundred sequins in his pocket was a lieutenant, but the Secretary of War objected to my having that rank immediately. However, he promised me that at the end of the year I would be promoted to that rank. Monsieur Pierre Van Dramen, an illustrious senator, obtained a passage to Constantinople for me. I set sail at the beginning of September and reached Corfu in fourteen days. At that time in Corfu, the Provveditori Generali had sovereign authority and lived in great magnificence. That post was then filled by Monsieur André Dauphin, a man sixty years of age, strict, headstrong, and ignorant. He no longer cared for women, but he liked to be courted by them. He entertained every evening, and the supper table was always laid for twenty-four persons. On landing, he was the first person I presented myself to. After my visit to him, I called upon the commander of Galice's, Monsieur de Air, to whom an acquaintance had kindly recommended me. After a short conversation, Monsieur de Air asked if I would consent to serve him as his adjutant. I accepted without hesitation. The next day I found myself established in his house.
The lady who was then most eminent for beauty was Madame Fay. Her husband, captain of a galley, had come to Corfu with her the year before, and Madame had greatly astonished all the naval officers. Believing she had the privilege of the choice, she'd given her preference to Monsieur Deher, and had dismissed all other suitors who presented themselves. I saw her for the first time at the dinner table on the very day of my installation at Monsieur Deher's, and she made a great impression upon me. I seemed to be gazing at a supernatural being, so infinitely above all the women I'd ever seen that it seemed impossible to fall in love with her. She appeared of a nature so superior to mine that I didn't see the possibility of rising to her level. This impression made upon me by Madame Fay was too ridiculous to last long, and indeed its nature soon changed. My position as adjutant procured me the honour of dining at Monsieur Deher's table, but nothing more. The other adjutant, the greatest fool I'd ever seen, shared that honour with me. We weren't, however, considered guests, for nobody ever spoke to us or even honoured us with a look. This used to put me in a rage. I knew very well that people acted in that manner through no real contempt for us, but it went very hard with me. At the end of ten days, Madame Fay, not having condescended to cast one glance upon my person, began to appear disagreeable to me. I felt piqued, vexed, provoked, and the more so because I couldn't suppose that the lady acted in that manner willfully. Indeed, I'd have been highly pleased with her if there had been premeditation on her part. I felt satisfied that I was a nobody in her estimation, and as I was conscious of being somebody... I wanted her to know it. At last, a circumstance offered itself in which, thinking that she could address me, she was compelled to look at me. Monsieur de Air, having observed that a very fine turkey had been placed before me, told me to carve it. I immediately went to work. I wasn't a skilful carver, and Madame Fay laughed at my want of dexterity. She said that if I hadn't been certain of performing my task with credit, I oughtn't to have undertaken it. Full of confusion and unable to answer her as my anger prompted, I sat down, my heart overflowing with hatred against her. I'd placed my money in the hands of a certain Maroli, a major in the army and a gamester by profession, who held the faro bank at the coffee-house. We were partners. I helped him when he dealt, and he rendered me the same office when I held the cards. We made up our accounts every night as soon as playing was over. The cashier kept the capital of the bank, the winnings were divided, and each took his share away. One day, as we were leaving the dinner table, a gentleman handed me a roll of gold that he'd lost on trust. Madame Fay saw it and said, "'What do you do with your money?' "'I keep it, madam, as a provision against possible losses.' "'No.' You hoard your money. You're a miser. Why don't you buy yourself a pair of gloves? The room rocked with laughter, and my vexation was all the greater because I couldn't deny that she was quite right. It was the adjutant's business to give the ladies an arm to their carriages, and it was not proper to fulfil that duty without gloves. I felt mortified, and the reproach of avarice hurt me deeply. So I spent my days in a continual state of rage, and the most absurd part of it all was that I felt unhappy because I couldn't control my hatred for that woman whom, in good conscience, I could find guilty of nothing. For all that, I had an ardent wish to punish her and make her repent. I thought of nothing else. I'd think of devoting all my intelligence and money to kindling an amorous passion in her heart, and then to revenge myself by treating her with contempt. But I soon realized the impracticability of such a plan, for even supposing that I should succeed in finding my way to her heart, was I the man to resist my own success with such a woman? But I was the pet child of fortune, and my position was suddenly altered. One day, Monsieur Deher sent me with dispatches to the captain of a galeaza. I had to wait until midnight to deliver them and when I returned I found that Monsieur Deher had retired to his apartment for the night. As soon as he was visible in the morning, I went to render an account of my mission. I'd been with him only a few minutes, 
when his valet brought a letter saying that Madame Fay's adjutant was waiting for an answer. Monsieur Deshaies read the note, tore it to pieces, and in his excitement stamped with his foot on the fragments. He walked up and down the room for a little time, then wrote an answer and rang for the adjutant to whom he delivered it. He then recovered his usual composure, concluded the perusal of the dispatch, and told me to write a letter. He was looking it over when the valet came in, telling me that Madame Fay desired to see me. Monsieur Deshaies told me that he didn't require my services any more for the present, and that I might go. I ran to Madame Fay's house, very eager to know what she wanted with me. I was admitted immediately, and I was greatly surprised to find her sitting up in bed, her countenance flushed and excited, and her eyes red from tears she had evidently just been shedding. She collected her thoughts for an instant, and said, "'Last evening my husband lost two hundred sequins upon trust at your faro bank. "'He believed I had that amount in my possession, "'and I must therefore give it to him immediately, "'as he is honour-bound to pay his losses to-day. "'Unfortunately I have disposed of the money, and I am in great trouble. "'I hoped you might tell Maroli that I have paid you the amount lost by my husband. "'Here is a ring of some value. "'Keep it until the first of January.' when I'll return the two hundred sequins. Meanwhile, I'm prepared to give you my note of hand. I accept the note of hand, madam, I said, but I cannot consent to deprive you of your ring. Within ten minutes you shall have the amount you require. I left her without waiting for an answer, and I returned within a few minutes with the two hundred ducats. I handed them to her and put her note of hand in my pocket. As I bowed to take my leave, she addressed these precious words to me. I believe, sir, that if I'd known you were so prepared to assist me, I couldn't have asked that service of you. Well, madam, for the future be quite certain that should you ask for this service again, it would never be refused you. What you say is very complimentary, but I trust never to find myself again under the necessity of doing so. From that moment I felt I was in love with Madame Fay, and I conceived the hope that she might return my ardent affection. On returning to my room, the first thing I did was to cross out with ink every word of her note of hand except her name. Then, putting it in a carefully sealed envelope, I placed it in the hands of a public notary. I ensured that his receipt stated that he would deliver it only to Madame Fay whenever she should request it. One evening there was an unusually large attendance at Monsieur Deshaies' assembly, and we were talking of the carnival which was near at hand. Everybody was regretting the lack of actors and the impossibility of enjoying the pleasures of the theatre. I immediately offered to procure a good company at my expense if the boxes were at once subscribed for, and the monopoly of the faro bank granted me. No time was to be lost, for the carnival was approaching, and I had to go to Otranto to engage a troop. My proposal was accepted with great joy, and the provveditore generale placed a servant at my disposal. The boxes were all taken in three days, and a merchant took the pit, two nights a week accepted, which I reserved for my own profit. I left Corfu in the evening, and having a good breeze in my favour, I reached Otranto by daybreak the following morning, without the oarsman having had to row a stroke. The distance from Corfu to Otranto is only about fifteen leagues. I had no idea of our landing, owing to the quarantine which is always in force for any ship or boat coming to Italy from the east. So I went only to the parlour of the Hospitali Lazaretto, where, placed behind a grating, you can speak to any person who calls, and they must stand behind another grating placed opposite at a distance of six feet. As soon as I announced that I had come for the purpose of engaging a troop of actors to perform in Corfu, the managers of the two companies then in Otranto came to the parlour to speak to me. I told them at once that I wished to see all the performers, one company at a time. An hour later, the manager of the first company, Don Fastidio, returned with all his performers, and you can imagine my surprise, when amongst them I recognized Petronio and his sister Marina. 
The moment she saw me, she screamed for joy, jumped over the grating, and threw herself in my arms. I engaged the troupe, and towards evening I left Otranto with twenty actors and six large trunks containing their complete wardrobes. At nine the next morning we landed at Mandrakia. As soon as my company was landed, the young officers naturally came to inspect the actresses, but they didn't find them very desirable, with the exception of Marina, who received, uncomplainingly, the news that I could not renew my acquaintance with her. I felt certain that she wouldn't lack admirers. The management of the troupe's performances brought me more than a thousand sequins. My manner with the actresses gained me great kindness— it was clearly seen that I carried on no intrigue with any of them, although I had every facility for doing so. Madame Fay complimented me. But the truth is that I was too busy through the carnival to think of love, even of the passion which filled my heart. It was only at the beginning of Lent and after the departure of the actors that I could give rein to my feelings— one morning, Madame Fay sent a messenger who summoned me to her presence. It was eleven o'clock. I immediately went to her and inquired what I could do for her service. "'I wanted to see you,' she said, "'to return the two hundred sequins which you lent me so nobly. "'Here they are. "'Be good enough to give me back my note of hand.' "'Your note of hand, madam, is no longer in my possession.' I have put it in a sealed envelope with the notary, who, according to this receipt of his, can return it only to you. Why didn't you keep it yourself? Because I was afraid of losing it, or having it stolen, and in the event of my death I didn't want such a document to fall into any other hands but yours. Then I can send word to the notary to transmit it to me? Certainly, madam. You alone can claim it. She sent to the notary, who brought it himself. She tore the envelope open and found only a piece of paper besmeared with ink, quite illegible except her own name, which hadn't been touched. "'You have acted,' she said, "'most nobly.' On the next day, Monsieur Fay, her husband, begged my commanding officer, De Air, to let me go with him to Patintro for an excursion of three days, his own adjutant being seriously ill. Patintro is seven miles from Corfu, almost opposite to that city. I went with him, and on the fourth day, which was Good Friday, we came back to Corfu with a large provision of wood. I found Monsieur Deair alone on the terrace of his palace. He seemed thoughtful. After a few minutes' silence, he said, Monsieur Fay's adjutant died yesterday. He's just been begging me to give you to him until he can find another officer. I have told him that I had no right to dispose of your person, and that he ought to apply to you. I have told him that if you asked me leave to go with him, I wouldn't object. On Easter Sunday I had an attack of fever which kept me in bed. I was still weak on the Monday, and intended to remain in my room, when a messenger from Madame Fay came to inform me that she wished to see me. I dressed rapidly and hurried to her house. I entered her room, pale, looking very ill, yet she did not inquire after my health. "'Ah, yes,' she said. "'You are aware that our adjutant died, and that we want to replace him. My husband has a very high opinion of you, and believes that Monsieur Deair leaves you perfectly free to make your choice. My husband believes that you'll come if I ask you myself. Is he mistaken? If you do come to us, you'd have that room.' She was pointing to the room adjoining her bedchamber. It was so situated that I'd be able to see her in every part of her room. Monsieur Deair, she continued, will see you here every day, so he won't be likely to forget his interest in your welfare. Now tell me, will you come or not? In less than one hour I'd taken possession of my new quarters. I found myself like the salamander in the very heart of the fire for which I'd been longing so ardently. Almost constantly in the presence of Madame Fay, seeing her from my room or conversing with her in her chamber, the first night passed by without any change being brought about by that constant intercourse. Yet I was full of hope, and to keep up my courage I imagined that love wasn't yet powerful enough to conquer her pride. One day, 
being alone with me, she said, "'You have enemies, but I silenced them last night. "'They are envious, madam, and they'd pity me "'if they could read the secret pages of my heart. "'You could easily deliver me from those enemies.' One day, being present in her room while her maid was cutting off the ends of her long and beautiful hair, I amused myself in picking up the bits and putting them on her toilet table. But one small lock I slipped into my pocket, thinking she hadn't noticed. However, the moment we were alone, she told me to take out of my pocket the hair I'd picked up from the floor. Thinking her unjust and absurd, I obeyed, but threw the hair on the toilet table with an air of supreme contempt. "'Sir, you forget yourself.' "'No, madam, I do not, for you might have feigned not to have observed such an innocent theft. Feigning is tiresome. "'Was such petty larceny a very great crime?' "'No crime, but it was an indication of feelings which you have no right to entertain for me. "'Feelings which you are at liberty not to return, madam. "'You have discovered my secret, madam.' "'and you may use it as you think proper. "'But in the meantime, I've learned to know you. "'I have discovered that you have little heart. "'That knowledge will prove more useful than your discovery, "'for perhaps it'll help me to become wiser.' "'After this I left her, and as she didn't call me back, "'I undressed and went to bed. "'However, the night passed off without my eyes being visited by sleep, "'and next day, feeling weak and low, I refused to have my dinner.' "'sending word that I was very unwell. "'Towards evening I felt my heart leap for joy "'when I heard my beautiful lady-love enter my room. "'Anxiety and want of food and sleep "'truly gave me the appearance of being ill. "'I sent her away very soon, "'but at eleven o'clock she came back with her friend, "'Monsieur Dayer, "'and coming to my bed she said, "'What ails you, my poor Casanova?' "'A very bad headache, madam, which will be cured to-morrow. "'Why should you wait until to-morrow? "'You must get better at once. "'I have ordered a basin of broth and two new-laid eggs for you.' "'I shook my head slightly. "'Just then Monsieur Dayer turned to examine an engraving, "'and she took my hand. "'I felt that she was giving me a small parcel. "'I opened the parcel, but feeling that it contained hair, "'I hurriedly concealed it under the bedclothes.' At the same moment the blood rushed to my head with such violence that it actually frightened me. That night I slept all night, but in my happy dreams I was with her, and the reality itself would hardly have procured me greater enjoyment than I had during my happy slumbers. On the following day, after presenting myself before Monsieur Fay, I went to have a little chat with the maid, to wait until her mistress was visible, which wasn't long and I had the pleasure of hearing her laugh when the maid told her I was there. As soon as I went in, without giving me time to say a single word, she told me how delighted she was to see me looking so well. From the day when, by giving me her hair, Madame Fay had betrayed the secret feelings of her heart, I spoke to her only of my love, of my ardent desires. I told her that either she must banish me from her presence, or crown my happiness. But the cruel, charming woman wouldn't accept that alternative. She answered that happiness could not be obtained by offending every moral law. My friend, be generous enough to spare me, for the sake of all the love I feel for you. What? I'd say. You love me, and you refuse to make me happy. It's unnatural. You're forcing me to believe that you don't love me. Only allow me to press my lips on yours, and I ask no more. No, dearest, no. It would only stimulate your desires and shake my resolution, and we'd then find ourselves more miserable than we are now. What? I said. You acknowledge your cruelty towards me? You condemn me unmercifully to the torments of the damned? You refuse me even the slightest favours? I'm now reduced to enjoying your shadow during the day, during the night, always, everywhere, except when I'm in your presence. At that passionate declaration, she was surprised and deeply moved. I folded her in my arms, and she offered me her lovely lips. Mine remained pressed upon them until I was compelled to draw breath.
After that conversation, in which I'd enjoyed the sweet nectar of my beloved's first kiss, I had the courage to behave in a very different way. She could see the ardour which consumed me, perhaps the same fire which burnt in her veins, but I abstained from any attack. One day she said to me, "'What gives you the strength to control yourself? "'After the kiss which you granted to me of your own accord, "'I felt that I ought not to wish any favour "'unless your heart gave it as freely. "'You cannot imagine the happiness that kiss has given me. "'It was the child of love.' "'Yes, dearest, of love, "'the treasures of which are inexhaustible. "'The words were scarcely spoken "'when our lips were engaged in happy concert.' She held me so tight against her bosom that I couldn't use my hands to secure other pleasures, but I felt myself perfectly happy. After that delightful skirmish, I asked her whether we were never going to go any further. Never, dearest friend, never. Love is a child which must be amused with trifles. Too substantial food would kill it. I know love better than you, I said. It requires that substantial food. And unless it can obtain it, love dies of exhaustion. Do not refuse me the consolation of hope. Hope as much as you please, if it makes you happy. Obedient to her wishes, but every day more deeply enamoured, I was in hope that nature at last would prove stronger than prejudice, and would cause a fortunate crisis. But besides nature, fortune was my friend, and I owed my happiness to an accident. One day Madame Fay was walking in the garden, leaning on Monsieur de Herre's arm, and was caught by a large rose-bush. The prickly thorns left a deep cut on her leg. Monsieur de Herre bandaged the wound with his handkerchief, so as to stop the blood which was flowing abundantly, and she had to be carried home. In Corfu, wounds on the legs are dangerous when they're not well attended to, and very often the wounded are compelled to leave the city to be cured. Madame Fay was confined to her bed, and my lucky position in the house condemned me to remain constantly at her orders. During the first three days, visitors succeeded each other without intermission, and I never was alone with her. In the evening, after everybody had gone and her husband had retired to his own apartment, Monsieur de Herre remained another hour, and for the sake of propriety I had to take my leave at the same time that he did. I had much more liberty before the accident, and I told her so half seriously, half jestingly. The next day, to make up for my disappointment, she contrived a moment of happiness for me. An elderly surgeon came every morning to dress her wound, during which operation only her maid was present. That morning the girl came to tell me to go in, as the surgeon was dressing the wound. The surgeon, being busy preparing a poultice at the other end of the room, and the maid having left, I inquired whether the inflammation went up her leg, and naturally my eyes and my hands kept pace with my question. I saw no inflammation, but I did at last see the object of my desire, and the lovely patient hurriedly let the curtain fall. Then, smiling, she allowed me to take a sweet kiss, the perfume of which I hadn't enjoyed for many days. It was a sweet moment. A delicious ecstasy. From her mouth my lips descended to her wound, and satisfied in that moment that my kisses were the best of medicines, I would have kept my lips there if the noise made by the maid coming back hadn't compelled me to give up my delightful occupation. The next day I was again present at the dressing of the wound, and as soon as the surgeon had left, she asked me to arrange her pillows, which I did at once. As if to make that pleasant office easier, she raised the bedclothes to support herself, and thus gave me a sight of beauties which intoxicated my eyes, and I protracted the easy operation without her complaining of my being too slow. When I had done, I was in a fearful state, and I threw myself in an armchair opposite her bed, half dead, in some sort of trance. I was looking at that lovely being who, almost artless, was continually granting me greater and still greater favours, and yet never allowed me to reach the goal for which I was so ardently longing. The next day, the moment the doctor had gone, she sent her maid out to make some purchases. 
After a few minutes, she said, My maid has forgotten to change my chemise. Then allow me to take her place. Very well. But I give permission only to your eyes to share in the proceedings. Agreed. She unlaced herself, took off her stays and her chemise, and told me to be quick and put on the clean one. But I wasn't speedy enough being too much engaged by all I could see. "'Give me my chemise!' she exclaimed. "'It's there, on that small table. "'Oh, well, I'll take it myself.' She leaned over towards the table and exposed almost everything I was longing for, and turning slowly she handed me the chemise which I could hardly hold, trembling all over as I was. She took pity on me. My hands shared the happiness of my eyes. I fell into her arms, our lips fastened together, and we enjoyed a voluptuous, ardent embrace, not sufficient to allay our desires, but delightful enough to deceive them for the moment. With greater control over herself than many women have, she took care to let me reach only the porch of the temple, without granting me a free entrance to the sanctuary. The next day the governor of the Galices issued orders for a general review. Monsieur Fay left in his galley, telling me to join him early on the following day with the servant. I took supper alone with Madame Fay, and I told her how unhappy it made me to remain away from her for even one day. "'Let's make up tonight for tomorrow's disappointment,' she said, "'and spend it together in conversation. Here are the keys.' When you know that my maid has left me, come to me through my husband's room. I followed her instructions, and we found ourselves alone with five hours before us. It was the month of June, and the heat was intense. She'd gone to bed. I folded her in my arms and pressed her to me. But she thought I had no right to complain if I was subjected to the same privation which she imposed upon herself. My prayers, my entreaties, were of no avail. Love, she said, must be kept in check with a tight hand. After the first ecstasy, our eyes and lips part, and we take delight in seeing the mutual satisfaction on our faces. Our desires revive. She looks on my state of innocence entirely exposed to her sight. She seems vexed at my want of excitement, and, throwing off everything which interferes with our pleasures, she leaps upon me. It's more than amorous fury. It's desperate lust. I share her frenzy. I hug her with a sort of delirium. I enjoy a felicity which is on the point of carrying me to the regions of bliss, but at the very moment of completing the offering she moves off, slips away, and comes back to work off my excitement with a hand which strikes me as cold as ice. What cruelty! I cry. You're burning with love, and yet you're depriving yourself of the only remedy which could calm your senses. Come, darling, light of my heart, come! Love can be fulfilled only in the retreat from which you ejected me at the moment of my greatest pleasure. She pressed me tightly in her arms, and I felt that she was submerging in an ocean of bliss. I loved you a few minutes ago, she said. Now I love you a thousand times more. Perhaps I should have loved you less if you had carried my enjoyment to its highest limit. Oh, how greatly mistaken you are, I said. Desires constantly renewed and never fully satisfied are more terrible than the torments of hell. Do stop deceiving yourself, my dearest. Let us be as happy as nature intends. You could be quite certain that the reality of happiness will increase our love. Believe me, the full gratification of desires can only increase a hundredfold the passions of two beings who adore each other. But after that night, so rich in delights, ten or twelve days passed without giving us any opportunity of quenching even a small particle of the amorous thirst which devoured us, and it was then that a fearful misfortune befell me. 
One evening, after supper, Monsieur Fay used no ceremony, and, although I was present, told his wife that he intended to pay her a visit after writing two letters which he had to dispatch early the next morning. The moment he left the room, we looked at each other, and with one accord fell into each other's arms. A torrent of delights rushed through our souls without restraint, without reserve. But when the first ardour had been appeased, without giving me time to think or to enjoy the most complete, the most delicious victory, she drew back, repulsed me, and threw herself, panting, distracted, upon a chair near her bed. My darling, we were on the brink of the precipice. I left her in a state of frenzy and rushed out towards the esplanade to cool myself, for I was choking. Any man who has experienced the cruelty of an action like that of Madame Fay will realize what I suffered. I was in that fearful state when I heard my name called from a window, and unfortunately I condescended to answer. I went near the window, and I saw, thanks to the moonlight, the famous Melula standing on her balcony. "'What are you doing there at this time of night?' I inquired. "'I am enjoying the cool evening breeze. "'Come up for a little while.' "'This Malula was a courtesan from Zamti, of rare beauty, "'who for the last four months had been the delight and rage "'of all the young men in Corfu. "'She was the talk of all the city. "'I'd seen her often, but although she was very beautiful, "'I was very far from thinking her as lovely as Madame Fay. I went upstairs mechanically, and she took me to a voluptuous boudoir. She complained of my being the only one who had never paid her a visit, when I was the man she would have preferred to all the others, and I had the infamy to give way. It wasn't desire which caused me to yield. It was a sort of spite, because the angel whom I adored had displeased me by a caprice. When I recovered my composure, I had but one feeling. Hatred for myself and for the creature who had allured me to commit so vile an insult to the loveliest of her sex. I went home, the prey to fearful remorse, and went to bed. But sleep never closed my eyes throughout that cruel night. I was cruelly punished for my disgusting debauchery. Three days later, as I got up in the morning... An awful pricking announced the horrible state into which the wretched Malula had thrown me. And when I came to think of the misery I might have caused if, during those three days, I'd obtained some new favour from my lovely mistress, I was on the point of going mad. Of one thing I'm quite certain. If such a misfortune had happened, I should have committed suicide. I prepared myself for a strict diet which would restore my health in six weeks without anyone having any suspicion of my illness. But I soon found out that I hadn't seen the end of my troubles. Malula had communicated to my system all the poisons which corrupt the source of life. I consulted an elderly doctor of great experience in those matters, and he promised to set me rights in two months. He proved as good as his word. At the beginning of September I found myself in good health, and it was about that time that I returned to Venice. But it was written in the Book of Fate that I should return to Venice a simple ensign, as when I left. The general didn't keep his word, and the bastard son of a nobleman was promoted instead of myself. From that moment the military profession inspired me with disgust, and I determined to give it up. During the last two months of my stay in Corfu, I learned the most bitter and important lessons. Before my adventure with the worthless Malula, I'd enjoyed good health. I was rich, lucky at play, liked by everybody, beloved by the most lovely woman of Corfu. When I spoke, everybody would listen and admire my wit. But after my fatal meeting with the courtesan, I rapidly lost my health, my money, my credit. Cheerfulness, wit, even the faculty of eloquence vanished with fortune. The influence I had over Madame Fay faded away little by little, and, almost without her knowing it, 
the lovely woman became completely indifferent to me. We left Corfu towards the end of September with five galleys, two galices, and several smaller vessels. We sailed along the shores of the Adriatic, where there are a great many harbours, and we put up in one of them every night. We had a fortunate voyage and cast anchor in the harbour of Venice on the 14th of October, 1745. Having performed the necessary quarantine, we landed on the 25th of November. As soon as I disembarked, I called upon Madame Orio. But I found the house empty. A neighbour told me that she'd married and left. I found Madame Manzoni still the same. She had predicted that I wouldn't remain in the military profession, and when I told her that I'd made up my mind to give it up because I hated the injustice I'd experienced, she burst out laughing. She inquired about the profession I intended to follow after giving up the army, and I answered that I wished to become an advocate. She laughed again, saying that it was too late. Yet I was only twenty. When I called upon Monsieur Grimani, I had a friendly welcome from him. When I inquired after my brother Francois, he told me that he'd had him confined in Fort Saint-André. "'He works for the Major there,' he said. "'He copies Simonetti's battle pieces, and the Major pays him for them. He's earning a living, and he's becoming a good painter.' I took a cordial leave of the Abbé Grimani, and proceeded to Fort Saint-André. There I found my brother, hard at work, neither pleased nor displeased with his position, and enjoying good health. After embracing him affectionately, I inquired what crime he'd committed to be imprisoned in this way. "'Ask the Major,' he said, "'for I haven't the faintest idea.' Just then Major Spiridion came in, so I gave him the military salute, and asked by what authority he kept my brother under arrest. "'Well, well I'm, 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 I'm not accountable to you for my actions,' he said. "'That remains to be seen,' I replied. I left the fort, fully bent on obtaining justice. The next day I went to the war office, where I had the pleasure of meeting my dear friend, Major Pelodoro, who was then commander of the fortress of Chiosa. I informed him that I wished to prefer a complaint against the Secretary of War respecting my brother's arrest. I also told him that I had decided to leave the army. He promised me that, as soon as the Secretary for War consented, He'd find a purchaser for my commission at the same price I'd paid for it. I hadn't long to wait. The war secretary came to the office and everything was settled in half an hour. He promised his consent to the sale of my commission as soon as he ascertained the abilities of my purchaser. Major Spiridion happened to arrive in the office while I was still there. The secretary ordered him rather angrily to set my brother at liberty immediately and cautioned him not to be guilty again of such reprehensible and arbitrary acts— I went at once for my brother, and we took furnished lodgings together. A few days later, having received my discharge and one hundred sequins, I threw off my uniform and found myself once more my own master. I had to earn my living one way or another, and I decided on the profession of gamester. But Dame Fortune wasn't of the same opinion, for she refused to smile upon me. In less than a week, I didn't possess a groat. What was to become of me? One must live. So I turned fiddler. Dr. Gossy had taught me well enough to enable me to scrape on the violin in the orchestra of a theatre, and having mentioned my wishes to Monsieur Grimani, he procured me an engagement at his own theatre of saint Samuel. Here I earned a crown a day and supported myself while I awaited better things but I was well aware that, if it were discovered, I should be the laughingstock of the persons who'd known me as a doctor in divinity, as an ecclesiastic, and as an officer in the army, and had welcomed me in the highest society. Nevertheless, by scraping my violin, I earned enough to keep myself without requiring anybody's assistance, and I've always thought that the man who can support himself is happy. I grant that my profession wasn't a brilliant one, but I didn't mind it. Nor was I long in sharing all the habits of my degraded comrades. When the play was over, I went with them to the drinking booth, which we often left intoxicated to spend the night in houses of ill fame. When we happened to find those places already occupied by other men, we forced them to leave the premises. 
and, after compelling the prostitutes to yield to us, we defrauded them even of the mean salary the law allows them. We'd very often spend the whole night rambling about the city, inventing and carrying into execution the most impertinent practical jokes. One of our favourite pleasures was to unmoor the patricians' gondolas and to let them float at random along the canals, enjoying by anticipation all the curses that gondoliers would indulge in. We would rouse up hurriedly in the middle of the night an honest midwife, telling her to hasten to Madame So-and-so, who, not being even pregnant, was sure to tell her she was a fool when she called at the house. We did the same with physicians, whom we often sent half-dressed to some nobleman who was enjoying excellent health. <laughs> the priests fared no better. We'd send them to carry the last sacraments to married men who were peacefully slumbering near their wives and not thinking of extreme unction. The city was alive with complaints, and we laughed at the useless search made by the police to find out those who disturbed the peace of the inhabitants. We were seven, and sometimes eight, because, being much attached to my brother Francois, I gave him a share now and then in our nocturnal orgies. But at last fear put a stop to our criminal jokes, which in those days I used to call only the frolics of young men. This is the amusing adventure which closed our exploits. In every one of the seventy-two parishes of the city of Venice there is a large public house called Magazzino. It remains open all night, and wine is retailed there at a cheaper price than in all the other drinking houses. People can likewise eat in the Magazzino, but they must obtain what they want from the pork butcher nearby, for he has the exclusive sale of eatables and keeps his shop open throughout the night. The nobility, the merchants, even workmen in good circumstances, are never seen in the Magazzino, for cleanliness is not exactly worshipped in such places. Yet there are a few private rooms which contain a table surrounded with benches in which a respectable family or a few friends can enjoy themselves in a decent way. It was during the carnival of 1745 and after midnight. We were, all eight of us, rambling about together with our masks on, in quest of some new sort of mischief to amuse us, and we went into the magazino of the parish of the Holy Cross to get something to drink. We found the public room empty, but in one of the private chambers we discovered three men quietly conversing with a young and pretty woman and enjoying their wine. Our chief, a noble Venetian belonging to the Balbi family, said to us, It'd be a good joke to carry off these three blockheads and to keep the pretty woman in our possession. He explained his plan, and under cover of our masks we entered their room, Balbi at our head. Our sudden appearance rather surprised the good people, but you may fancy their astonishment when they heard Balbi say to them, under penalty of death and by order of the Council of Ten, I command you to follow us immediately without making the slightest noise. As to you, my good woman, you needn't be frightened. You'll be escorted to your house. Then two of us got hold of the woman to take her where our chief had arranged beforehand, and the others seized the three poor fellows who were trembling all over and hadn't the slightest idea of resistance. The waiter of the magazino came to be paid, and our chief gave him what was due, enjoining silence under penalty of death. We take our three prisoners to a large boat. Balbi steers us to St. George, where he lands our prisoners, who are delighted to find themselves at liberty. After this, the boatman is ordered to take us to St. Genevieve, where we land after paying for the boat. We proceed at once to Palombo Square, where my brother and another of our band are waiting for us with our lovely prisoner, who is crying. Don't weep, my beauty, says Balbi. We won't hurt you. We intend only to take some refreshment at the Rialto, and then we'll take you home in safety. So she follows us to the Two Swords. We order a good fire in a private room. When everything we want to eat and to drink has been brought in, we send the waiter away. Then we take off our masks, and the sight of eight young, healthy faces seems to please the beauty we had so unceremoniously carried off. We soon managed to reconcile her to her fate by the gallantry of our proceedings. 
encouraged by a good supper and by the stimulus of wine, prepared by our compliments and by a few kisses, she realized what's in store for her, and doesn't seem to have any unconquerable objection. Our chief, as a matter of right, claims the privilege of opening the ball. By dint of sweet words he overcomes the very natural repugnance she feels at consummating the sacrifice in so numerous a company. However, she doubtless thinks the offering agreeable, when I present myself as the priest appointed to sacrifice a second time to the god of love, she receives me almost with gratitude. And when she finds out that she is destined to make us all happy, she can't conceal her joy. Our exploit over, we put on our masks and escorted the happy victim to St. Job, where she lived. Believe it or not, in perfect good faith, the charming creature bade us good night and thanked us all. Two days afterwards, our nocturnal orgy began to be talked of. The young woman's husband was a weaver by trade, and so were his two friends. They joined together to address a complaint to the Council of Ten. The complaint contained nothing but the truth, but the criminal aspect was somewhat obscured since the document stated that the eight masked men hadn't rendered themselves guilty of any act disagreeable to the wife. The document produced three results. In the first place, it amused the town. In the second, all the idlers of Venice went to St. Job to hear the account of the adventure from the lips of the heroine herself, and she got many presents from her numerous visitors. In the third place, the Council of Ten offered a reward of five hundred ducats to any person giving information as would lead to the arrest of the perpetrators of the practical joke. The offer of that reward would have made us tremble if our leader, precisely the one who alone had no interest in turning informer, hadn't been a patrician. But I knew that, even supposing one of us were vile enough to betray our secret for the sake of the reward, the tribunal would have done nothing. They'd never have implicated a patrician. There was no cowardly traitor amongst us, although we were all poor. But fear had its effect, and our nocturnal pranks were not renewed. End of CD 3 CD 4 During this time in Venice, I had the good fortune to gain the friendship of three noblemen. One of them, Monsieur de Bragadin, a senator. Another belonged to the Dandolo family. And the third was a Barbaro. They were all in their middle years. My three worthy friends had intelligence and wit, but they were superstitious and no philosophers. They were more than good Christians and faithful to the church. They were real devotees and full of scruples. They weren't married, and, after having renounced all intercourse with women, they'd become the enemies of the female sex, perhaps a strong proof of the weakness of their minds. With these three extraordinary characters, who were certainly worthy of esteem and respect for their moral qualities, their honesty, their reputation and their age, as well as their noble birth, I spent my days in a very pleasant manner. I completed the conquest of their friendship by relating to them the whole of my life, only with some proper reserve, so as not to lead them into any capital sins. You might say that if I'd wished to follow the rules of pure morality, I ought to have declined intimate intercourse with them. This I can't deny, but I'll answer that I was only twenty years of age. I was intelligent, talented, and had just been a poor fiddler. Through the friendship of these three men— I was certain of obtaining consideration and influence. And indeed, so it turned out. One day, Monsieur de Bragadin called me to him and said, I know you and appreciate you. If you'll be my son, you have only to acknowledge me for your father, and until my death I'll treat you as my own child. Your apartment is ready. You may send for your clothes. You shall have a servant, a gondola, and ten sequins a month. That's the sum I used to receive from my father when I was your age. You needn't think of the future. Think only of enjoying yourself. 
Use me as your adviser in everything you may wish to undertake, and you may be certain of always finding me your friend. I embraced him, calling him father, and he folded me in his arms and called me his dear son. I promised to love and obey him. His two friends, who lived in the same palace, embraced me affectionately, and we swore eternal fraternity. Such is the history of the lucky stroke which, taking me from the vile profession of a fiddler, raised me to the rank of a grandee. After this, my life in Venice would have been pleasant and happy if I could have abstained from punting at Basset. The ridotti were open only to noblemen who had to appear without masks in their patricians' robes, and wearing the immense wig which had become indispensable since the beginning of the century. I insisted on playing, and I was wrong, for I had neither prudence enough to leave off.